Hello, I'm Dell, and welcome to what you need to know about home studios for social media. Now this episode is on green screening, chroma keying, or matting if you prefer. An old technique, originally glass matting, dates back to the early days of film, where literally film had to be exposed to a tremendous amount of light, so they had a glass pane in front of the camera and they matted out a section that they wanted to do magic in. And then they ran the film with the first run and then came back and matted out everything but where it was matted previously, ran the film a second time and you ended up what's called a double exposure. Now most people are familiar with cameras, film cameras, know what a double exposure is and most of the time it comes from when you did not mechanically advance the film. Not all of them had winders and if you reshot a second photograph on top of the originally previously exposed negative you had like ghosting. You had both images imprinted on the negative. When you developed it you had like a ghost effect. You often had overexposures and things if each, can, if each one was shot properly. Now in the early days they had special effects where they would simply put the glass sheet in front of the camera and black paint out, mask out a section and then they would run the film exposing all areas except that which was deprived of light and then they would come back and rewind the film, clean off the glass and paint over everything that wasn't previously painted over so that you expose the other portion or what had been hidden under the glass protecting the original exposure by the black paint of everything else being masked. And it worked pretty good. The primitive cameras didn't hit the same sprocket holes exactly the same and you would get some jitter back and forth as that film was exposed the second time. And they can do things like that and had been doing that for a number of years until they came up with a process called the traveling mat or the floating mat, whatever you want to call it, where they mask out a certain bit, usually filming against a totally black area so that there really wasn't anything there, no light to expose to the film. And then they would run the film with whatever they had in center screen, work pretty well. And then they would come back after they took that particular negative, they would end up exposing it over and over again until it became totally white and then ran a, another film behind it and composited it mechanically, I mean, through the film. Now, we can go through all the other versions of how things happen, but eventually we got up into the modern age of digital cameras and chroma keying, where we actually have the ability of using a color to identify as something to take out. Now, the problem with using a color is the art of using chroma key is that you pick a color. And a color can be very hard to come by a specific color that you want to subtract because one thing you can't have them out of clothes is a nice bland gray clothes like like the wall behind me. And you could pick a color that was kind of hard in your environment to find. Like if you're outside, a blue sky might give you trouble and the green grass might give you trouble. So they have different colors over different periods of time. Now there was a technique where they use a sodium vapor light which again puts out a fairly narrow spectrum, a nice uh, leptocurtic curve of the frequencies. Now each color is nothing more than a frequency, a composite of frequency. Now we know about red, green, and blue. Those are our primary colors. And we know that if we mix the red and blue, we get purple. If we mix the red and yellow, we get the orange and so on, right? So when we look at our color spectrum, the light being reflected back to us is actually a combination of frequencies. And the more narrow that frequency, the more purer the color. Now in a green, a pure green in RGB, I think you'll find out will be digitally represented as 00, zero FF00, zero zero, red, green, blue. Zero red, zero blue, all green. And that's great. Now Pantone, they have other, because they're dealing with pigments rather than um, light frequencies, but 
the, the, the chroma keying works the same way. It's picking a color which is represented by a number and doing adjacent colors to it. Boom, boom, boom to widen the key to take more out for uneven lighting or whatever. And I can take any color of paint and if I hit it with a yellow light, I'm going to reflect a little different color than if I hit it with a white light or a fairly blue light, fairly cold light. So your lighting has an effect over it. Now, when we talked earlier in a previous show about your studio, is it going to be multi-purpose, kind of a thing where you come in and put stuff up, or is it going to be a permanent solution, a permanent set? Now, in this case, this picture is what most people would use for a temporary backdrop, which includes a green screen backdrop or, or material. Something that you would have behind you that you could then key off of to digitally remove from your picture. The problem with most of these are, one, it takes about an hour to set, it, set this thing up and to pull the wrinkles out and, and to try to get it lit without shadows and other problems. And we know that you can get what we call a spill a green spill or a blue spill, whatever it is, whatever color you have, the light, when you light it really bright to take away the shadows and to take away the fold, you often then reflect light back on the back side of whatever you have in front of it. And they call that spill, and so it can give you a nice little green glow. Now where we might use the different colors, blue actually was probably, I think, if I remember my history right, was used before green was. And it worked fairly well. It's just one of the, because it is a primary color. Red, uh, red, yellow, and blue are the primary colors. Green is very popular, although it's a mixture. So in, in the digital world, you have the ability to take out a number. Now I'll show you this chart. Now this, com this is the chroma key, a snapshot of the chroma key section in uh, OBS, but also here's a different version that we use a color wheel in the video editor that I use, Power Director. One is a color wheel, the other is sort of a, a matrix, and beside each one of them you have luminescence or you have the white value or the brightness to it, so you go from like the lightest color to the darkest color in a purity of that pure color that you would pick, and that pure color is going to be a ratio of those primaries. So what you'll see is it becomes very difficult to get a uniform color. And that's all you're trying to do. It can be it can be any color you really want as long as like for instance you could do white but see there's so much white reflection white in this beard that if I try to take out a white background I'm probably going to take out the beard too. So we try to find the most dissimilar color. And blue is actually the most dissimilar to most people's flesh tones, but it may not work against the sky. So it depends on your subject. Sometimes you can reverse them. Now, blue may actually work well, but green, they say, is easy, reflects more light. And I don't know if the physics behind that, I don't know that that's necessarily, I think it's practically accurate, but I don't know that it's actually physically accurate because a lot of cameras will actually have green compensation in it by the number of pixels in the, or receptors in the uh, CMOS sensor. So that what you would have is the ability to augment the green to make sure you have plenty of green signal in your video to work with. And if green naturally reflected more light, I don't see that we would actually need to augment the screen colors. If you ever looked at an old-fashioned CRT or cathode ray tube, the old tube type TVs, when they hit color, they had three different phosphorus. And they were always in some kind of a little triangle or a group. And as the beam of electrons would come by, they had three different guns. And the three different guns would, would hit, if it, if it wanted to make a color, it would hit one color a little lighter than the other to make, for instance, our RGB we talked about. If you wanted a green dot on the screen, they turned the guns off for the red and the blue. So the only one where you were hitting was that green. If you wanted white, you hit all three 
hard and that made a white spot. If you wanted black, you didn't hit any of them. And so that's this kind of idea that we want to think about when we think about the frequencies of light being reflected off of your screen. Now, this screen again, the one that's up on the backdrop in this picture, it's not a professional green screen color, but it's a light green and it's actually felt versus muslin or vinyl and it worked pretty good. I'll tell you a quick story if I've got the time and I guess I do. Um, we had early on, I tried vinyl because it doesn't wrinkle. I had a beautiful dark green piece of vinyl and I cut a piece off and I took it and I used it as a vinyl backdrop until I put about 1500 watts on 1200, 1500, whatever all the lights were on it to get it even. And I discovered the inside of it had a printed pattern that looked like marble, like a dark marble. And so that wouldn't work because I couldn't see it with my naked eye in the natural light. But when I illuminated it properly, all those imperfections came out. And in this case, the imperfections were actually designed into the vinyl as it were. So that didn't work. We're just looking for a nice uniform color of some sort. Now you might try painting. And I watched a brilliant presentation by an Englishman who, who had, the question was, should you, should you uh, scop on down to the B&Q and, and find you a color match to a green? or should you use professional, quote, green screen paint? And the conclusion at the end of it, he painted two um, substrates of some sort, foam boards. Now you can use like sheathing, but a lot of the sheathing has little lines in it where it runs across in the calendar process. But if you had a sign material, some sign materials like core board, actually have ridges just like corrugated paper on them, but perhaps you can find a core board or foam board as a nice paper front, nice smooth, or a plywood or something to paint on. Then the question was, which paint should you use? And the gentleman, I had so much, I enjoyed his presentation. He did a beautiful job, a brilliant job of comparing the two. He had taken a piece, a sample of a vinyl backdrop and had his paint company match it. And they reproduced that paint brilliantly. And it was great. And then he put the two boards behind him in the back and then illuminated it and brought up. And he could then, by taking um, down to the similarity, down to about one or so, he could show by digital manipulation that the lighting was uneven on the B&Q paint and perfectly fine under the other. It was a better. And at the end, I just... He, he, he evaluated the cost of that and I have nothing against buying professional green screen paint if you can find it but it's generally I think what I found sold by the gallon and gallon paint costs more than quart paint per can now per ounce we find that quart paint always costs more than gallon paint it's just it's this the way they sell it so, because you have the container and the time and the mixing and all that, it's just more expensive to buy a smaller quantity of paint. So at the end, I said, you did a brilliant job of explaining that quart paint costs more per ounce than gallon paint and that a darker green reflects less light than a bright green. Now, the pigment, if it's adequately applied across the surface, is going to be uniform. Okay, it's going to be uniform. You're not going to get bright spots and dark spots if you get adequate coverage. The, I believe the inadequate coverage on the periphery, in his example, was that he didn't have it lit properly. He could have improved his lighting. And that's where most people have trouble with green screening is getting the light. The backgrounds need to be lit uniformly and often that takes quite a bit of light. And to get that light on there, you often have shadows which change the reflected uh, frequency, the, the color that comes back, the, the composite color of intensity of white content to hue, to the actual tint or hue of the paint. And so it becomes very difficult to do. Now, in this picture, this is a green screen I painted on the back wall behind the studio. I don't, in Studio O, I don't have much room in there. And originally I put a flag back there really for a purpose of, of controlling sound in the room, but it also hid the fact that that wall was chipped and beat up from about 16 years of banging a rolling chair against the back wall. And so the question was, 
I don't really like green screening because it can be very difficult to light and not to have the, fudge, the fuzziness on the edge and the speckledy, the, the um, uh, dithering that you might see in it. And it's just kind of a difficult thing to do. But the question is, can you green screen with a regular paint? And yes, you can. Now, the way I would do it and the way I did do it is I did pick a fairly bright or pure color, tried to cross it to a perfect green, a 00FF00, but most paint stores can't or won't do that to an R pure RGB reference. They'll do it to their colors. And this is a Valspar paint, luscious green, a color I picked off of, of a chip, and we painted it, and I think it's fairly bright. It looks nice and dark if you don't have a light on it, and it looks very bright and can even go to a teal depending on how much light and the frequency that you're you're actually presenting against the subject the wall you know me and and the wall but it worked fairly well and it was thirteen dollars for a quart thirteen dollars for a quart versus a gallon of something that i would have to special order in in my area and that really runs that that number up now you may only use a certain number of ounces with it but if you don't need those, you're not going to do any good and paint goes bad over time. So I chose to go a do-it-yourself color painted. Now on the edges are fairly good, but one of the edges I noticed I used a frog tape, which is a brand type of tape, a wet edge tape, but then also 3M has a, in the blue masking tape, has a similar product. Maybe I didn't quite get it pushed down hard and I got a little bleed, but it wasn't bad. It's not, certainly good enough for a studio and it works fairly well, which will be another show because we've already hit 18 minutes. Now, one of the things that I want to do in, the, in that production when I put the paint on there is I did not want a semi-gloss, a satin, a semi-gloss or a gloss because that makes bright spots in the green screen. You want something that's very matte and for that, I also chose a short nap roller. Now, when I started this, I went to town, of course, got what I was looking for. And then I thought, surely I have a decent uh, short nap roller. And uh, turns out I didn't, but I did want to go ahead and get at least the first coat on, figuring that I've really never seen paint that doesn't take more than one coat. Now, I don't know that anybody needs to see this, but... You see that little little lighter spot here and there? And there's some down here. Well, that's because I just didn't get it good in one coat. And there's a few spots. There always are. I have never been able to get a paint job perfect in one coat. Just It's just not in me. And here's what I use. Uh, first thing I did, I did, I did not really realize that my rollers had reached the end of their useful life and the first coat I painted covered very well and it's supposed to be a one pass paint but I've never personally had a one pass paint my eyes just don't see those bright spots when the as it starts to dry you have you know you have the different color it just presents the different colors until it completely dries and you see where some white spots are so on the second pass I got a proper brand new paint roller and the texture is, I think, very, very good. So anyway, I think we've talked about enough about it in this pass. And what we'll do on the advanced version is we'll come back in and we'll actually go into OBS and set up the uh, compositing, the, the green screening, take some stuff out. And depending on the quality of your camera will make a big difference. If you happen to have a camera that has a little, a little bit of the dithering of the noise, that can be a problem. So we tend to want to brighten up the subject so that the sensor in the camera works real well, but then that tends to change the color that's reflected back. So you have to kind of play a little bit with it, but that would be no matter what green screen color you chose to have in your studio. And again, you may not be able to paint a back wall. My wall was already so, so, uh, knackered up from the chair. I didn't feel I was hurting anything to paint it and it does give you some flexibility again not super big on green screening but the wall looked terrible and I got tired of seeing that Tennessee flag behind us so won't you come back for the next episode I think this is going to be a little bit of a special and I'll smatter a little bit of that in there I just want to cover the basics first 
before we get into some of the very specific things. Although you might be more interested in the specific things. But as we refer back to the earlier shows, the type of studio and facility that you have in order to set your home studio up will define what you would do with it. 